Well, good morning, Southside Bible Church. It's a little different. I got half that group. I'm gonna get, I'll get used to it before we're done. I'm grateful for anyone visiting us this morning. We love to have visitors who come worship our God together, so we're glad to have you. Uh, baptisms, what a great celebration. I was encouraged by just how succinct those children were on the simplicity and the beauty of the gospel. So praise be to God for what he's doing uh, with our young ones there. I noticed the, the youngest Franco child, so succinct, Rodney, keep working on that. She just went right to the point, nailed it. No circling around. It was beautiful. So uh, turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. It's been a good season in Philippians as we've been laboring in this epistle together, just learning how do we glorify our God? How can we ever go from vainglory, where this, this life of wanting to have glory for yourself, wanting to matter, wanting to be the one, the focus, the one who's uh, worshipped, and the selfishness that has been inbred since the fall of Adam, how do we move from that to a new soul that you're, you're sovereign, you're, you're, you just want that sovereign one glorified and worshipped? How, how can that ever happen? And I want you to hear this, that there's no power that we, this testimony is there's no power that can ever make that change. It's a miracle of God. It's called the grace of God, and it's called being born again. And Jesus said, unless you are, you're not going to enter into the kingdom of God. And that is a kingdom that we're learning is of humility and love. It begins poverty of spirit and it begins to change this selfishness to an others oriented to lay our lives down and love and care about them and wash feet. It's a kingdom that has not been designed for lovers of self. Jesus said it's a narrow way that leads to life. And the way you'll enter is stripped naked of all pride. And your agenda and your glory will never fit through this narrow way into the kingdom of God. It all must fall off and be thrown down. And you take up your cross and you follow after Jesus, whose life was to please his Father and to glorify him and all that he did. Uh, that was his food. That was his resolve. And we're to walk in those footsteps. And so the gospel is your great glory and your boast and your hope. In Philippians 3, Paul says, we're the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and we glory in Christ Jesus and we put no confidence in the flesh. How beautiful it is. This is the ground and the deep bond of what brings our unity this morning is in this gospel. And so we've been learning that this gospel unifies us and Paul has been laying out the poisons that can break this unity of the Spirit and the Bride of Christ, that break down what we share. And man, this is just getting clearer and clearer for my own soul, that unity is broken by self-glory. When you matter more than the glory and beauty of Jesus Christ, you will hurt and break down and destroy a body. Your selfishness will be bigger than the name of Jesus Christ. And when you begin grumbling and disputing that we looked at last week, uh, by, by those who Christ is not enough, but your agenda, your name, your glory, your ministry, your treatment by others will be bigger than the glory and the beauty of Jesus Christ. We will break unity when that happens, that, that we have everything in Christ and that God is working everything for our good. We have all things. And that in those truths, guys, we're journeying together to glory to learn how to be content in all things. That's where this letter is moving, to get to this place where I, I know my God, I trust my God, I know he's working to finish the work he started, and instead of being this grumbler mumbler, I'm becoming a person who's content, I trust everything that God has given, he's doing, and he will bring. It brings us into this sweet place of blessed contentment. And so just real quick, I don't do anything real quick. Um, yeah, you got the same problem? Just getting out of bed is slow these days. Uh, we got cut last week in Philippians 2.14, do all things without grumbling and disputing. I, I heard from many of you this week of what God was doing in your hearts. I got a text from, from a lady in the church. Uh, I think she summarized a lot of our hearts. She said, my flesh is screaming bloody murder 
for it knows that it shall die to this with all of my heart now on Christ Jesus. It must die. And so how did it go this week? Uh, My week last week before I stood up was doubling down on grumbling and realizing how deep it really runs, how deep it abides in my own heart. This is a sin that going after in my own strength and my own flesh is like a pea shooter trying to stop a roaring lion. You you will not uh, weaken this, starve it, or break it in your own strength. It is too deep uh, in the heart to just kill in our own flesh. You, You can't weaken, starve it, or put it to death in flesh. So how do we fight this? So I want to start our sermon. Last week, I ran out of time with some application. Um, What I said last week is that you cannot try to just bite your tongue so you don't grumble. Grumbling is an issue of, of the heart that springs forth. It's a discontentment in the heart with, with your own self-glory. You're not getting praised enough, loved enough. All your circumstances aren't working out the, the way you want to, to have everything work out. And that's where it comes from. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so if we're going to ever grow in this, we have to get to the heart. And Philippians 2.13 is the hope that it's God who's in you, causing you to will and to do his good will. And so there is the power of God within us to begin to mortify this and put it to death. Philippians 1.6, he who began a good work in you will complete it. He's going to be taking away this discontentment and grumbling and leading us deeper and deeper into a contentment in Christ. And so the only way to put this to death, as someone said this morning, is looking to Jesus, just looking to him, communing with this Christ, abiding in him in John 15. I'll tell you this, religion and conservative values cannot fix this issue. Moralism will not nip this, they'll just nip it in the bud, but uh, just cut flowers and not get to the root. So only Christ, only by faith, seeing all that he is, all that he's done, and all that he promises to do through the means of grace is the only way you'll ever put to death and mortify this sin in your heart. And then seeing the sin for what it is, Paul commands us, you work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And so we begin to diagnose it. And discontentment with God and his workings and provisions are at the heart of our grumbling. Idols that are being blocked, idols that you must have, and when they get blocked, what will come out of your life is anger, discontentment, and grumbling. Hurts from growing up in a fallen world. Wrong identity will bring grumbling. Not believing the gospel that you are loved by God infinitely this morning will bring about a grumbling. So simply, if I had to summarize all that we looked at last week, is is fullness in Christ produces praise, trust, and a contentment in God. And emptiness produces grumbling, disputes, selfishness, divisions, a critical spirit about others, not hoping and believing. You start putting the worst spin on everyone. This is what empty people do. And some of you this morning, you just need to repent and by faith turn back to Jesus and live into this gospel and marvel that you're not in hell, but you're loved by God. And you heard this last week and the Spirit moved in your heart and He worked. And as children of God, we we repent of, of this great God that we grumble against all his goodness to us on a daily basis. And we believers look at that and they repent. I say, oh God, created me a clean heart, change me, fix this in, in my life. That's what believers do. But for some of you, I just want to speak with judgment day honesty. Your whole life and existence is just one of bitterness. You're a gnarly dude. It's all conflicts. Just always disappointments and anger. This is who you are, what you are characterized by. This, you need to look in the mirror this morning if that's you. The fruit of the Spirit is not your life. You're weary and heavy laden, 
with trying to live this Christian life in your flesh, and your whole existence is one big grumble against the living God. Hold still while we do some surgery this morning, if that is you. Jesus says, come to me if you're weary and heavy laden with trying to do this. And, and my yoke is easy and my burden is light and I'm going to give you rest for your soul. To Have I entered into the rest that Christ is offering for? Maybe grumbling could tutor you to Jesus Christ this morning that you just can't stop. It's who you are. It's everything about your being. And it's revealing that you haven't come to Christ to find this rest. And so I just pray if that's what you need this morning, that you wouldn't rest in religion or biting your tongue, that you would come and let him change your heart to where what starts coming out of your mouth is praise and thanksgiving and edification to other people. What, what a gospel that we have. So let's read Philippians 2, 14 through 18 is where we left off. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain." But even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. Let's go to our God. Father, we come before you this morning. Do this work in our hearts. Let, there, let the gospel so encourage our hearts because we have encouragement in Christ, we have consolation of love. We have fellowship of the Spirit and affection and compassion. You've given us all things in Christ. God, let our hearts be made full and glad. And let the things that come out of our mouth be the things that make for peace and edification and for the glory of our God. Lord, do this work in our hearts. Let us have ears that hear the word of God this morning. Go deep into every heart, wherever they're at, Holy Spirit. Meet them and reveal what they need to hear from this word this morning, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Here's your outline as we're working through verses 14 through 18. Paul's giving us six encouragements for how to work out your salvation. You remember back in verse 12, that was the command for the believer to work out this great salvation that God has worked in us. And so the first encouragement last week we began looking at, I'm going to call it the pattern of the Christian life. How, how are we to live? How are we to work this salvation out? Well, the first pattern that Paul addressed is to do it without grumbling and without disputing. And now I want to move to the second point, the pursuit of the Christian life. And if you look in verse 15, there's a so that. So that as you quit grumbling and disputing, you will prove yourselves. And the structure here, this is what's called a purpose clause. And so the purpose that you're going to quit grumbling and quit disputing in the body of Christ is, is for a very clear purpose. And so the purpose for not grumbling and not disputing is not so you feel better. It's not because it helps your blood pressure. There's studies that show your blood pressure can come down if you quit doing this. It's, there's studies that show you'll be happier if you don't spend your whole life uh, nitpicking. You're going to have less wrinkles. This is a weird thing. As I'm growing older, you can learn what wrinkles from smiling go here and wrinkles from frowning will go right here. So I, I don't know if there's any science to that or not, but I, I, there is to this. Don't be lemon-sucking Christians. Do not be that. There's something bigger than that that Paul's after here. He wants you to quit grumbling and disputing so you can prove something. And I thought he was going to grab the word dokimatsu, which we saw in Romans, was this testing in fire of metal. And what comes out is this approved metal. But he chose a different word, and it's the word become. And it's in the present tense. So do this so that you're going to be becoming something. This is what we are becoming as Christians. <clears throat> Work out your salvation. And, and as you do, do it without grumbling or disputing. This is what we're to be becoming. We're to be growing into these kind of people. 
And so that is why Philippians 1.6 and learning how to be content is really big. I want you to catch this. Paul said, I learned to be content in all things. It's a journey, guys. It, 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 we're all in it. And we're, it's this process of learning and being transformed by the renewing of our minds to get to this place where I can say, I've learned to be content in all things. When I was 18, I wasn't. I had all these plans, and every time they didn't work out, I was frustrated, depressed, discouraged. So I want you to see we're all being, God's finishing the work he began in us to quit grumbling and disputing and to become content in all things in him. But this is where we're going. This is where we're all trying to become this beautiful thing. So I don't want you to to despair because this is going to get finished in glory. So that saying that I like so much, it's, It's direction, not perfection, that God is going to be working in us. And what is he working in us? Oh, wait, one last thing. (laughs) It is not grumbling to share your prayer requests, your hurts, your burdens, and your struggles with one another. Do not fall off the cliff on the other side. We need each other to help carry each other's burdens. Grumbling is a spirit of the heart, and it's a mumbling and a grumbling against God for what he's doing versus, brother, can you pray for me? because I'm struggling. And so if you, if, you, if you say, I can no longer share my struggles, my prayer requests, you, you fell off on the wrong side. So I just, that's for free, okay? <laughs> he wants us to become, in verse 15, blameless and innocent. The word for blameless, it, it means faultless, without reproach. One who is free from accusation or blame. I love in Daniel 6, 4, that the commissioners and satraps began trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs. But they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption. And as much as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in this man of God. So they found one scandal against Daniel. They said that he prays three times a day. The only thing they could come up with is he prays three times a day to his God. That's the picture of this word. What could they find on us at work? And you come back to our context, are you the one who's always grumbling and complaining with the best of them? He slanders the boss and others just like everybody else. He or she loses their temper and gets in disputes. They're never on time. They take long lunches. They live on the phone. Uh, how about neighbors? What, what could they bring? The charge, the claim. Uh, this is a hard question. How about your children? Dad is so different at church. Um, I do the same things at church, and he smiles, and he, he says nice things, but at home, he doesn't smile and say nice things. He complains the whole way over and walks in church and tells everyone to rejoice in the Lord always. He argues with mom the whole drive, and then he puts his arm around her when they walk into the church. Uh, Guys, this is so important to take into all of our lives. We're to live in a way that we're above reproach. That's what this is calling us to be. Not perfect, but humble ourselves when we blow it. Blameless as we confess and we deal with our sins, and, and the world will never say they're sorry. This is the spirit of one who's content with all that God is for him in Christ. You'll enter into this world and there's a difference to you because you're not trying to go for everything. You already have everything in Christ. You'll be blameless. Acts 24, 16, Paul says, in view of this, I do my best to maintain always a blameless conscience before God and before men. And so we're coming in saying, I want to be this. And the second thing is he says, you're to be innocent. And that meant something pure or unmixed. It was undiluted wine or unalloyed metal. Pure or sincere. Not, I'm of the world and I'm of God going back and forth. It's just this, I'm unmixed. My heart is for God. My heart is steadfast, oh God. It's given to him. It's, it's settled. We get a picture of it throughout the Old Testament. The Israelites were told, don't plant a vineyard with different kinds of plants. Don't unite under the same yoke animals of different species. Don't make clothes mixed with linen and wool. And it doesn't just seem kind of meaningless sometimes when you read that, but it makes a nice, comfortable shirt. 
but there's something bigger. It's this beautiful typology that's going on. And Israel was being showed, you don't mix. There's pictures of separation. Stay separate from, from the Gentiles and their idols and the heathens. And then Christ comes perfectly innocent. He was unmixed with this world completely. He was set apart to his God with his heart, mind, soul, and strength. He, he fulfilled the law. And so we are not to be duplistic. I'm not a Christian on Sundays uh, and, and just go live any way I want the rest of the week. We're, we're to be holy Christian outside and inside all day, every day. We're to be unmixed with this world. We're to be innocent and blameless is the call here. And so our pattern is not grumbling and disputing. And then our pursuit is to be proving ourselves to be separate and different from this world. And the third now, I want to come to the pedigree of the Christian. And he says in verse 15, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent. Listen to this. Children of God, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world. <clears throat> so you're to be becoming children of God above reproach. And so I want to make sure there's no confusion here. Aren't we already children of God by adoption? And that's what we labored in Romans 8 for a year. Uh, you are children of God by adoption. You, anyone who has faith in Christ sits here this morning as a child of God. But we are to keep becoming children of God. We're to becoming it. We're, we're to grow up into living like children of the King. I think it's calling us to, to live the life of trust and faith and contentment in our God. So you, you keep growing and learning what it means that you are a child of God. As I keep learning and growing in this, I'm learning more and more how much I can trust my father, how much I can give to him, how much I'm not a slave, I'm adopted. And so we're growing in to these realities that this morning, God is for you as a father. And that changes so much about you. Keep growing into this ability of, of, through the Word of God and the Spirit, to trust Him in everything. To just not, Christians are the best at saying we trust God in everything, and then not trusting Him, anxious, fearful, just as worried as the world. He doesn't want us to be that way. He wants us to be growing up into being children of God, where I trust my God. I have confidence in Him. I have faith in what He's doing and where He's taken me. I trust God. God. That's where we're all going. That's what we're trying to be becoming. So you're not trying to become a child of God. You already are. But I'm trying to become a child that lives into the fullness of what that means. And that is what I have given my life to since being converted. I want to know what it means to be a child of God. I want to live into that. I pray that every day. I try to pray that Lord's Prayer, our Father. God, will you show me what that means for my life today? What does that mean? if I live in to the fullness that you're my father. I belong to him. Let me bring honor to you by the way I live, by making you look great by the way I trust you. Doesn't sonship make you want to honor him more? The perfect father, he loves me with a perfect love. How do I honor you? I want familiar, familial likeness. Luke 6.35, love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, <clears throat> and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. I want to manifest my Father to this world and show the familiar likeness of being a child of God. Live like sons of God in this world. Live consciously of whose I am. I want to represent my Father is what Philippians 2 is telling us. So act as children of God, above reproach. That word meant the absence of defect in an unblemished animal. I want to live without grumbling is our context. I want to live a life of contentment in my Father. And I just can't think of a greater sin grumbling against my Father all day long while He's giving me everything that I need for life and godliness pushing his hand off for everything he's doing to shape and mold. I, I just look at it sometimes and say, stop. Let's trust our Father and let him do what he wants to do in his children. 
The only father who will never get it wrong. Never. Infinite wisdom, all love, as he's working for our good to finish, shape, and work us. One of my favorite parts about being a pastor is I get to watch the hand of God in your life. And I just sit and marvel. You know how many times I've sat at my desk going, I don't know why you're doing this, Lord, but I, I trust you. And I get to watch the, the, the back end and the things he teaches and what he does. And it, I just tell you, it's marvelous how great our God is and what he's doing in each and every life. And he just never gets it wrong. So if you're sitting here feeling like he gets it wrong, be becoming a child who can trust God even when it feels like he's getting it wrong. Because he never will. He never can. That's for free. That's our pedigree. Children of God. Isn't that a great pedigree? You should walk around with a smile on your face all the time. You're a child of the living God. Ha! <laughs> I don't care if my name's Murphy or, you know, Irish. I'm a child of God. So there is our, our pattern is grumbling and disputing stop. The pursuit is be becoming this. And the pedigree is growing in to the depth and the knowledge of being a child of God. And this is the part I really want to drill in on. I want to look at the place in which we are to do this. And I think the good, the good news is the other two points are next week. So this is our last point. Just check in with me if you're getting tired. What a blessing to gather together on Sundays and do this. I, I don't think I've ever loved the Lord's Day more in my life. I, it just, I'm starting to, this is our place, guys, to come reorient from a hard week that God's glory is the chief end of my life and it's all that matters. And my only hope is in Jesus Christ. And I come in here every Sunday and through everything that goes on, he just reorients me. And so I love the Lord's day and there's so much like-mindedness with us that I, I just wish we could stay here all day, every day and never go home. Wouldn't that be fun? I think that's what they did in the early church. So I like that. But Paul doesn't say the church is the only place for this to be worked out. So for those who, there, there's kind of two spectrums. Usually, I just want to lock up, put my pajamas on, sit on the rooftop, stay away from this evil world. The other is I want to go out drinking till I drink too much, and I'm, I'm going to evangelize every person in that drunk bar. And you're both falling off on either side of, of the cliff. <laughs> We're going right to Jesus' narrow, narrow way today. So I... Oh, Paul is saying, look at that one word. He says, in the midst, to be blameless uh, and innocent children of God above reproach, in the midst of what? A crooked and perverse generation. And, and so he's in the midst. Well, uh, Pastor, I'm too holy to do that. I can't go there. I'm sacred. The world is so bad. There's so much pressure and it's trying to conform me into its mold. It hates God. It hates his word. It hates his standards. Yes, it does. It rejects his gospel. Do you know that when he wrote this, they did too then? Honey, let's just buy a cabin and go up to the mountains and get away from all this. Let's get back to the good old days of Little House on the Prairie. I love that series, but that's not where we're going, guys. This verse is so convicting in the midst. And I studied it in the Greek and looked at it from every angle, and you know what it means? In the middle, in the midst, in the center. There's just, you can't get away from it. Just do this in the midst of a, of a wicked generation. That is where this needs to take place. You need to go around darkness for your light to shine. Have any of you ever used a flashlight in the midday sun? I have. You know what it does? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Stars, you can't even see them during the day. So am I saying, let's, let's get out then to all the bars and go to every movie theater and buy everything from Target, um, <laughs> Starbucks, Hollyweird? For some of you, yes. Some of you, you're not ready and you need to grow, and you need help. But for some of you, the answer is no. But for everybody here this morning, get out and live your lives in the midst of the following 
kind of people. And I've been pounding on this for years. When the mission field becomes your enemies, you, you've lost it. They're our mission field. And we don't hate them. And we don't destroy them and slander them and defame them. We, we love them. Here's what you got to get into the middle of. A crooked world. I love the Greek word, scolios. Scolios. One of the most vivid memories I had growing up as a kid is my brother Jim was hit by a car when I think he was about eight or so. And he went 34 feet. All these numbers are a little off, but high. And he landed flat on his head. And he had like 73 stitches in his skull. But what it did is it, it messed up his spine. And, and later in high school, he had a surgery where he had a 39-degree curve in his back. And after the surgery, they, they straightened out the spine, put a metal bar in there. Uh, I think he gained two or three inches after that surgery. We moved to Florida, and he had a full body cast. Can you imagine how he smelt? He and I shared, I'd go in his room, and it was brutal. But to look at him, I'll never forget it, he was just so crooked. And it's such a good picture of this generation that we're to go live in the midst of. Uh, what could be a better word? It's crooked. It's just crooked. They, they twist the straight paths of God. The things that are light, they, they call dark, and the things that are dark, they call light. They, they're bent from the righteousness of God. They're, they're not upright. Well, do you get surprised when the world acts evil? <laughs> they're crooked. They're supposed to act evil. We'd be a part of it except for the grace of God. And I still have remaining sin that makes me act crooked on days. So get this. Their view of life, their view of possessions, their view of sex, their view of food, their view of entertainment, their view of marriage, parenting, life after death, democracy, they're going to get it crooked every time. Don't you want to come out from this twisted way of life and think rightly about God and live uprightly? If you're visiting this morning and you're crooked, God wants to make you straight. And there's a gospel of Jesus Christ hanging on a cross for your sin that can instantly do the surgery that my brother had. You could be straight before God by the work of Jesus Christ. And the other word is perverse. It was a vessel on a potter's wheel that had become misshapen. It literally meant to be depraved, to just be off, misshapen, and twisted. And we're to live this way, folks, in the midst of a crooked and perverse and depraved generation. Paul knew what we were to go live in. It hasn't, it's not because it's worse. It's, it's always been these hearts that are this way from the birth canal. Everything is working against our work. The world won't accept you if you're becoming children of God. And one, one, one uh, preacher said, we're to be mixers in the world, but not mixed up with the world. So we're, we're going to be in the midst, but we're not mixed up by their thinking and what they love and what they're pursuing. So this is the arena that God has chosen for us to live in. And I think it's the message that America needs to hear and Southside needs to hear this morning, and I need to hear this. The million-dollar question, why? Why do we want to go out in the midst of that? It's way easier at home. I, I love it at home. My wife never persecutes me. It's so sweet. When I talk about Jesus, she loves it. She listens, and we agree on almost everything. So why, why go out in the middle of that where nobody agrees with anything that I say, they hate me, they want to kill me. Some of you look that way right now. And this old illustration that I've always used is, is when you go look for diamonds, they, they never put them on, on, a, on a white backdrop. They always put it on a black backdrop. Why? So the diamond will radiate. And God is saying, I've plucked you out and I've changed the way you think, love, what you desire. You are so different from this world. And you go into the midst of this world, it's dark, so that you're going to shine for the light and the glory of Jesus Christ. I like Paul's better than mine. He says, it's among whom you appear as lights in the world here in this verse. And the Greek word is luminaries, stars. 
And so those who live in the city of Denver, if you go out at night, you see very few stars. I think that's my least favorite thing about the city. You just can't see many stars. But if you go up camping, and I highly recommend it, because of the darkness, what happens? Those lights just shine, shine. And so hear this. Darkness is what makes lights shine the way they do. It just, you're going to shine so bright because of all the darkness around you. And so to grumble about the darkness all day, every day, you're missing the gift that all this around me is so that I'll shine. And when I tell them about Jesus and live this way, they're going to ask me, what's the hope within me? You got the darkness all wrong. Quit grumbling and disputing about the darkness. It's from God. And that darkness, oh, that's your mission field. That you would shine and not be conformed to the darkness and not start thinking and acting like them. So we're to live in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation to be lights and not to grumble and complain. How? Because we love the gospel and we love its spread. And the deep unity with a whole bunch of diversity in this room this morning, serving one another in a deep sacrificial way from all walks of life, without grumbling and disputing, but a deep contentment in Jesus Christ, becoming blameless and innocent and growing into living as children of God, working out our salvation with a humble Christ likeness, you will shine. You will shine. In Matthew 5, Jesus said this, you're the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how will it be made salty again? <clears throat> the only way to make salt not salty is to mix it with dirt. And so if you mix with the world, you're not going to be salty. It's good for nothing anymore except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. We'll be good for nothing in this kingdom if we mix and drink the dirt of this world. You're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do men light a lamp and put it under the peck measure, but they put it on a lampstand and it gives light to all who are in the house. Why? Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and never worship you, but glorify your Father who is in heaven. And when you quit being these dividers, prideful, selfish, grumbling, disputing people, you're going to make your father look really good because I trust him and I trust everything that he brings into my life. And this world doesn't have an answer for it. And they're asking me and they're wanting to know how you're doing. It doesn't mean you don't have tears and you don't have pain. It means that in the tears and the pain, you trust your God. You've settled that in your heart in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we're right back to the chief end of the Bible and the plan of salvation, the glory of God. We want men and women to see our God and to know our gospel. Our purpose is not to hide out and put it under a bushel. And I want you to hear that so clearly. It is not to hide out and put this light under a bushel till Jesus comes back. You're gonna have to renew your mind in truth if that's where you're stuck. We're not the frozen chosen. The light of the Christian is to expose darkness, to reveal and to guide others to our gospel. Our lives are to show the salvation of Jesus Christ. Our lives ought to commend Christ. Paul said we're living epistles. And I love that saying, there's five gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in your own life. And most will never read the first four. We must be bright stars in the midst of a crooked generation. We're to love this generation and what they need is bright stars, not people who go and show them that we can live just like the world and still be Christians. They, they need light. Like it's, this is our calling people before God. That the growing darkness is not to be grumbled, but to be our backdrop to shine Jesus shine. Man, is that bigger than your little tootsies getting stepped on. That is a bigger deal than someone who walked by you and ignored you. 
Your glory not being noticed enough is so small in light of this. I was told by this one writer, it said, rivers which run through lakes, they do it without mingling their waters with them. So may we flow through this world without mingling in its ways. May we be in the world, but not of the world. This is our calling, to be in the world, but to not act like it and think like it, to shine. That is the need of our day. People are, are, I think we're living in a little revival, especially with the young people. Get out and get into lives. Everywhere I go, people want to hear this gospel like never before. This isn't the time to hide and lock yourself away. Get before God and just, am I getting out? Am I in the midst or do I go into the darkness and, and hate it and grumble about them and, and be ugly? This is, this is, come on. Let's get with our God and deal with our hearts. I read about a lighthouse keeper and someone asked him, they said, are you scared there by yourself? And he said, I know I'm safe. I only think of having our lamps burning brightly and keeping the reflectors clear so that those who are in danger may be saved. Pretty simple philosophy. I'm safe in Christ. I'll never know a drop of God's condemnation ever again. I'm the safest person on the face of the earth and so is every believer. My only burden is to have my lamp burn brightly so that those who are in danger of hell may be saved. I want to shine so that they can see the place to find rescue in Jesus Christ. We can't let sin dispel the light. We can't hide it under a bushel so that the lost can find the harbor of heaven by God's grace through our lives. That's why our unity matters so much. I pray it matters to every heart in this room. And we can't let go of our self-glory. We dim our light by selfishness and grumbling and disputing. We must glorify God by our unity as we work together to lift up the name of Jesus Christ and his gospel to anyone who will hear. This is so condemning to the church today because we're trying gimmicks to get lost people to come to the church. We're trying every possible thing we can to make it attractive for unbelievers to want to come. And what we're called to do, you know what's supposed to draw people into our church? Holiness. A lighthouse. That they come in and say, surely God is in this place. We're to be stars. Southside, let's be these luminaries in a dark world for the sake of the gospel and the glory of our God. And I was just so beautiful. I just, we live in a world that everybody wants to be a star. <laughs> self-glory, self-exaltation. And so I pray that we would be stars that light the way to God's glory. There's the North Star, Jesus Christ, and we're, we're the Big Dipper. We just want to be a church to appear as luminaries and stars in a world. And there are so many stars in this church that I'm watching you suffer and go through so many things. And glory to God just keeps coming out. Contentment, deepening in it, learning how to be content in all things. And it just makes God look so glorious and bright by these children who are growing into what it means to be a child of God. Holding fast the word of life, we'll look at that next week, to hold it forth and hold it out. John Brown when we did Romans, we used his commentary in the 1800s. He was used for a great revival, but uh, he, he had a seminary student ask for counsel. And he said, well, my young friend, see that you hold up the lamp of truth to let people see. Lift up this word and let people see the glory of the gospel. Hold it up and trim it well. But remember this, you must not dash the lamp in people's faces. That would not help them to see. So speak the truth in love. May we be full of grace and truth and live distinctive Christ-like lives in this world and shine and point crooked and perverse people to a perfect righteousness in Jesus Christ that he gives by grace through faith. This is burning in my heart. To God be the glory. Let's pray. 
Oh, Father, make us luminaries. Make this church shine so bright in the darkness. Help us to not be conformed to this world, grumbling like it, disputing like it, thinking like it, always just got something negative. God, I pray, let us be those so filled up with Jesus Christ. We have so much in him, so much consolation of love and encouragement in Christ. Lord, you have just given us everything in him. You've withheld nothing. Anything that you could communicate, you communicated to us in Christ. God, let us be the fullest people on the face of the earth. Let us enter into a society that has never been more discontent and grumbling, and let us go and just shine. Show them Jesus uh, in a whole new way until people just start wanting to hear the truth of what's made us this way. So God, help us to be becoming these kind of men, women, and children. Grow us and conform us and let us stay in in beautiful, distinct unity together to want that name lifted up more than our own name. God, you be the hero. You be the one exalted and loved and glorified in this body. Throw down anyone in the way of that, including my own heart. You alone be the glory. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.